Tonight's guest speaker, Dr. Aaron Adams, is the Director of Science and Conservation for Bonefish and Tarpon Trust. He's also a senior scientist at FAU's Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institute. Dr. Adams holds a PhD from the University of Massachusetts, Boston, and he's been conducting fish research for more than three decades. As a staunch advocate for habitat conservation and ethical angling, Dr. Adams works to translate science for the angling community. He's authored three books, dozens of peer-reviewed scientific publications, numerous magazine articles, and he's a regular on televised fishing programs. Tonight, Dr. Adams will be telling us about some critical tarpon research being carried out by Bonefish and Tarpon Trust. It is with the greatest pleasure that I introduce my good friend and longtime colleague, Dr. Aaron Adams. Thanks, Zach. Um, pleasure to be here, and thanks for everyone for tuning in. Um, so yeah, tarpon um, are a pretty amazing fish, uh, and they give us a really good uh, view of some of our uh, conservation needs, management needs, not just for tarpon, but for a lot of other fisheries as well. So I'm going to run you through. Um, uh, first, I'll talk about a lot of the challenges that uh, we face from tarpon conservation. And I'll dig into some of the research that we're doing uh, to address knowledge gaps and the conservation threats. And I'll end uh, with some suggestions on uh, how you can help uh, help to restore our, our fishery, not just for tarpon, but for other species as well. So what is the Anthropocene? The Anthropocene is a term that scientists have given to the current geological age. Um, and they name it the, the Anthropocene because it's a time during which human activity has been the dominant influence on, on climate and the environment. Um, and all you have to do is look at a, a map of, of Florida and see how it's changed from what you might imagine it was 100 years ago to see some of that influence. So tarpon themselves, um, they've been around in their present form for over 100 million years. Uh, so they've obviously been through a lot of changes. So in that way, they're, they're pretty resilient, um, but they're facing a lot of challenges. Um, the geographic range, um, as you can see here, the red areas on the map, um, are in the Atlantic Ocean only, um, and especially on the western side of the Atlantic uh, and throughout the Caribbean and Gulf of Mexico. Amazingly, they're related to eels, bonefish, and ladyfish uh, because they all have the same type of larvae. This is uh, what, if you looked at this a picture, uh, unless you were a specialist, you wouldn't be able to tell if it was a bonefish, uh, an eel, or a ladyfish, or a tarpon. And I'll get more into the specifics of the uh, tarpon uh, life cycle to help explain that a bit more. Uh, tarpon are also long lived. The oldest one that's been documented thus far uh, was 80 years old uh, when it was captured and sampled. Um, and who knows how old they lived way back when before there was a fishery for them. And they don't get sexually mature till they're about 10 years old. Um, so in that way, from a conservation perspective, they're similar to sharks, um, which are also late to mature and slow growing, which means that Anytime you see a population decline of tarpon or sharks, it's going to take a while for that population to recover. So what we're seeing now as far as the tarpon population is really not a reflection of today so much but as it is of 10, 15, 20, even 30 years ago. And importantly, um, tarpon support an economically uh, valuable recreational fishery. So they're part of what we call the flats fishery in the Florida Keys, which is uh, tarpon, bonefish permit, and snook to a lesser extent. And that fishery has an annual economic impact of over $460 million, um, which is pretty tremendous. Um, they're also part of the state's overall saltwater recreational fishery is worth over nine and a half billion dollars. Uh, so it's pretty big. That's a larger portion of the state's economy than a lot of other uh, sectors for sure. And if you spread out even farther, we know that tarpon are part of the flats fishery in everywhere from the Bahamas to Cuba, uh, Belize, Mexico, throughout the, that region. Um, and in, in Belize, for example, uh, tarpon helped to contribute over $55 million a year to the economy. In Mexico, it's $45 million. Uh, the flats fishery, which is focused on bonefish but includes tarpon, is about $169 million in the Bahamas. Uh, so it's a big uh, economic engine. And the key here, of course, is that having a healthy tarpon population or any other economically important fish depends on healthy habitats. And I'll keep coming back to that theme, that theme uh, throughout the talk. 
So first we have to understand the fish before we can study it and know what the conservation requirements are. And so I'm gonna run you through a, a quick description of, of the tarpon life, life cycle. So this is the picture taken from a flats boat uh, on a sand flat. A friend and I were out uh, fishing for tarpon and this is part of the excitement in the fishery if you don't fish for them already. Um, they're large, um, they can, uh, are often over 80 pounds, 150 pounds. The biggest I put my hands on is about a 200 pounder. So they're large fish. When you hook them, um, they jump almost without fail and jump a lot and they're bright silver. So it's a, it's a very charismatic uh, type of interaction. And they spend a lot of time swimming in shallow, clear waters. So you don't necessarily go out and just chunk some bait for tarpon though you could. The most exciting way to do it uh, is to uh, get your skiff or your boat in some shallow, clear water and uh, look for the tarpon swimming across the flat and getting a lure fly or bait in front of them. Uh, and then the excitement really begins. So it's a, it's a pretty thrilling experience. Um, this is a picture of what the anglers call a daisy chain. Um, in the foreground there, you can see the end of a fly line um, with a fly somewhere in that daisy chain. And the fish are, are swimming in a counterclockwise circle. And we see this a lot in uh, pre-spawning and spawning season, um, mostly somewhat April, but mostly May and June. Um, in areas like the Florida Keys, uh, Southwest Florida, and some other places. And the thought is that this is a pre-spawning behavior. A lot of times you'll see a few uh, large, uh, especially large fish, which we think are the females, uh, with a lot of smaller fish mixed in, which we think are the males. And sometimes you'll see those males bumping um, the larger females, probably again, some pre-spawning um, behavior going on there. Other times we see this type of behavior are uh, one, when there's a predator, like a big hammerhead shark around, a lot of times the tarpon will um, get into a daisy chain uh, like this, or maybe even a little bit tight, more tightly packed as predator avoidance. And then if they're cruising, a lot of times they'll cruise in what, what we call strings, just long lines of tarpon will cruise along a sandbar or a beach. And if they get to a spot where it gets super shallow or the stand, sandbar becomes perpendicular to them, sometimes they'll go in a circle like this where they kind of figure out, get their bearings uh, before they head off again. But this particular picture was a, a fish just before um, a full moon in June. And their peak spawning times are around full and new moons uh, in May and June in Florida. Um, so Florida is a pretty important pre-aggregation spot. When they spawn though, they don't spawn near shore. Um, these uh, blue ovals show locations that we've identified uh, where tarpon likely spawn. Uh, we know they go offshore to spawn. Uh, colleagues have captured uh, those larvae that I've shown you the pictures of that are only a day old uh, out in these areas uh, depicted by the ovals. And we know from some satellite tagging data uh, from five, six years ago that tarpon uh, undergo deep dives to three or 400 feet uh, when they're out in these places around the new and full moon. And that's the same behavior that we documented for bonefish. Uh, we've documented them going down to 450 feet as part of the spawning process. Um, and that was actually with bonefish a live track. And so we're certain that spawning. Uh, and so we're pretty sure that tarpon are out there spawning at those times. And we find those uh, baby uh, larvae as well. And we also know that ladyfish and eels also spawn uh, offshore in deep water like this. So all those species have been around for many millions of years. So it's a, a strategy that's, that's worked for them pretty well. We don't know where they spawn in the Caribbean yet. And we know that there's some spawning that occurs north of Florida during the summer but we haven't quite identified those areas yet either. So conservation concerns for these offshore locations, you might think, ah, oh, who cares? We're out in the middle of nowhere. Um, but there's a lot of pressure on deep sea mining, for example, that spot up near Louisiana, that smaller oval, um, that's exactly where the deep water horizon oil spill occurred. Um, so we're certain that spawning did not successfully occur during that year. Um, and we don't, also don't know the long-term effects of all that oil that remains in the environment on the larvae. Um, and we're also concerned about there's a push for offshore aquaculture, um, cage aquaculture like they do for salmon in the Gulf of Mexico. And we're concerned about the, um, the antibiotics that go into the water for that, um, the viruses, escapements, all those types of things. And might, their effects might be on tarpon migrating offshore to spawn. So as I said, after they, when they spawn um, offshore, they're in large groups and they do what's called broadcast spawning. Um, they just eject the eggs and sperm into the open water column. Fertilization is external. The eggs hatch in about a day. 
and out comes um, these leptocephalus larvae. Now for tarpon, those larvae float around in the open ocean uh, for about a month. Uh, for bonefish, it's longer, it's up to uh, almost uh, three months, uh, but for, for tarpon, it's about a month. And these white arrows uh, depict um, some of the possible um, dynamics of the larvae being flushed by the currents uh, back in shore. Um, and so to some extent, the larvae are at the mercy of the currents, but they do have some um, behavioral abilities and they are able to swim. So they can control their direction to some extent. But the currents, um, if they're lucky, bring the, the larvae back into shore around that 30 day uh, time window, um, at which time they look like this as they're coming into the coastal estuaries. So they look a lot more like a fish. Um, they actually almost look like uh, larval anchovies. And sometimes we get reports of people seeing larval anchovies, large schools of them um, that look like these tarpon, they think they might be tarpon. Um, but these little tarpon like this, they usually come in indivi as individuals, not in schools, um, and often at night. So we, we're unlikely to see them. Um, when they come in, they're looking for places like this, um, and not just the creek itself, but if you look to the far left, um, you can see, I'm using my cursor here, this um, kind of dead end pond. That's what those little larvae are looking for. If it's super mucky, so you'd sink to your waist if you stood in it, if it's full of mosquitoes, and if it smells like sulfur, um, that's perfect for juvenile tarpon. Um, as they grow, um, to get this size, this guy's probably about six months old or so, um, they start moving out of those uh, mucky backwaters and more into creeks. And this is a picture of kind of a perfect uh, juvenile tarpon habitat, overgrown with mangroves. Uh, you can see the water there is kind of a, a brownish color, so it's not clear water. Um, and one of the reasons that tarpon are back in these areas is because the conditions are really tough for their predators, other fish like jacks and ladyfish. When tarpon are, after they've uh, come into these backwater areas, they're very small juveniles, um, their gills aren't super well developed. And so they actually have to get most of their oxygen uh, from the surface. So tarpon are unique in that their, um, their swim bladder is modified into the spongy tissue, so it's kind of like a lung. So they can actually roll at the surface, gulp air, gulp that air into their air bladder, and use that oxygen just as we would um, with our lungs, breathing, breathing air in. And so these juveniles are able to stay in these murky backwaters that have not much oxygen in the water, and they're fine with that, but their predators, or fish predators, I should say, like ladyfish and jacks and even snook, uh, can't really get back in there to get them. And so that's a pretty good um, way for them to protect themselves against predation. Some of their biggest predators are wading birds like egrets, uh, herons, uh, and even um, uh, alligators and crocodiles will make a meal of a, of a juvenile tarpon back in these spots. Okay, so with that as, as kind of our, our spot on giving you the broad overview of the life cycle of tarpon, so you can under, start to understand where a lot of the stuff I'm going to talk about now fits in, I'm going to talk about um, their overall conservation status before I break into some, more, some stuff more specific to Florida. So the conservation status, according to the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, which evaluates all we know about as many species as possible and puts them on a scale from being completely fine to endangered, vulnerable is about halfway on that, on that scale. And they're considered vulnerable uh, for a number of reasons. One is historical harvest. You can see on this graph, it's annual tarpon landings in metric tons. So that's a lot of fish landed by year. And you can see that in Brazil, Colombia, Mexico. In the 1960s, uh, there was a lot of harvest of tarpon. Uh, and interestingly, in about the same time period, there was an interest in harvesting tarpon off the Southeastern United States uh, with the intent of making it uh, dog food and cat food. Unfortunately for us, who like to fish for them, the dogs and cats didn't like the meat, so that didn't work out so well. In South America and Central America, uh, tarpon are actually uh, um, harvested for food, and in a lot of places they still are, but not to this extent. Um, these were often with uh, large net boats, and you can see that after some high catches in the mid-60s, uh, the fishery pretty well crashed. Um, and that's pretty common for a slow-growing, long-lived fish like tarpon, especially when the harvest by nets was mostly on these spawning aggregations that I've been talking about. So you can basically get fish that have migrated from hundreds or thousands of miles away to a spawning spot um, and scoop up 
you, much of your pop, adult population um, in well in one fell swoop. And so I think we're seeing some of that, some of those effects even now um, with a decent tarpon population, but not what it once was. Um, they also suffer a good bit from uh, what we'll call habitat alteration, which is kind of a catch-all term for a lot of things like habitat degradation, um, fragmentation or breaking up of habitats. That would be something like putting a dam into a stream so a fish can't move up and down. Water quality declines, which we all know about with the harmful algal blooms and too much pollution. Um, and then also water flow alterations. So if you, even if you had absolutely pristine water coming from Lake Okeechobee down the St. Lucie River, the Clusahatchee River, the drastic change in salinity of that water from full ocean to full salt in a rapid time frame when they dump the water, that in itself would kill a lot of organisms. So it's not just the quality of the water, it's the, the flows, the alteration of the flows. So you can see from that graph or that picture on the right, um, on the left side of that picture is an aerial photo from the early 1950s uh, in Southwest Florida. And on the right is the exact same spot um, uh, five years ago. So you can see uh, this where my cursor is, this creek is this creek. And in the left-hand um, image, uh, you can see all kinds of these isolated ponds, creeks, small creeks connecting them, more ponds, those types of things. This was all perfect juvenile tarpon habitat, and it's all gone. Um, and so we've um, been uh, conducting some uh, restoration activities in these areas to try and bring back some of these habitats. And if you look in the lower right of the right uh, photograph, you can see some kind of remnant canals. I'm circling them with my my cursor right now. Um, and I'll, I'll refer back to those in a little bit. Um, another issue is harmful algal blooms, which <clears throat> I've talked about already. The tarpon themselves are somewhat affected by them, especially red tide, but more so the harmful algal blooms affect what they eat. And as a, as a, a guide friend on the west coast of Florida says, um, if you take away the groceries, uh, the nothing in the store, the fish are going to stop coming. And so those algal blooms even if they don't directly affect the tarpon by uh, killing a lot of their prey, uh, then the tarpon may respond by moving off to other places, uh, changing their patterns of migration, those types of things. And those are long-term effects. And finally is uh, catch and release mortality. Uh, so uh, the likelihood of tarpon surviving after they're caught and released is, is rather high. Historically, um, it wasn't. Uh, people didn't know how to handle tarpon appropriately to ensure that they um, live after they're let go. But uh, the state of Florida, based on research done by um, colleagues, has uh, changed the regulations for tarpon. So if a tarpon is over 40 inches long, it's illegal to remove that tarpon from the water. And that's because research, research showed that if you remove large tarpon from the water, you increase their chances of dying tremendously. So keeping them in the water um, is essential. And as I said, it's actually illegal to do otherwise. Smaller tarpon seem to be a bit more resilient to handling, but even so, uh, if you catch one, uh, keep it in the water or briefly pull it out of the water for a picture. Um, the general rule is if it's not still dripping water in the picture, it's been out of the water too long. So shifting uh, gears here, I'm gonna start talking about the, the things that uh, basically make tarpon click and how those uh, processes are changing and how that's affecting tarpon. And I'll wrap up with some of the research that we've been, been doing to address these issues. And again, how you guys can help. So and it's a basic science here and it makes sense, um, but the amount of habitat influences fish population size. So I, as I was mentioning, juvenile tarpon depend on those backwater mangrove wetland habitats. So to a great extent, the population size of tarpon is limited by the amount of juvenile habitat available. So to the extent that we've lost a lot of that habitat already, the tarpon population will likely never be as big as it once was, even if we stopped all fishing for them, just because there's not as much habitat. And you can take those same types of, of, of statements and apply them to most of the other fish um, that we deal with in, in the conservation world. Habitat quality influences the health, survival, and abundance of fish. So it's not just the amount, it's the quality. So you can see this uh, beautiful seagrass bed in the upper left photo. And this is a picture of the same spot 
um, years later after uh, years of harmful algal blooms. And so those algae blooms um, essentially shaded the seagrass, so it didn't give much sunlight. And so it was already stressed from a physiological perspective. And then once that, those algae blooms, once the, the organisms that cause those blooms die, they sink to the bottom and the decomposition process basically sucks up most of the oxygen in the water and that's what finishes off the seagrass. And if you look at this photo, it is of turtle grass, which is um, the, from a, say, what I would call an ecological perspective. If, if I was a, a fish looking for prey, turtle grass um, provides the most diverse prey compared to other grasses. Um, but it also uh, takes the longest to recover if it's wiped out like it has been here. Uh, for example, there's some research in the Caribbean showing uh, anchor damage, say from sailboats anchoring on a seagrass bed, uh, can take an order of 15 years to recover. So it's not a quick process. Water quality, of course, water being the most important habitat to fish is important. This is a picture from the Fort Myers News Press of the red tide bloom in 2018. I'm sure everybody remembers that. And in the foreground, you can see the bright green of a cyanobacteria bloom that's come down the, uh, the Caloosahatchee River. Um, so again, this not only affects tarpon, but uh, everything that they depend upon for prey. Um, and that tends to be a long-term recovery. After the 2018 red tide, um, a conversation with the guy who fishes in the Charlotte Harbor area, um, he told me that on a flat that he fished frequently, it took three or more years for the crabs and shrimp and small fish um, that he used to see before the red tide to come back on that flat. And so until he started seeing those prey, he wasn't seeing the redfish and snook and spotted sea trout that he used to fish for there as well. So again, broad scale application implications of this. And finally, I talked about habitat fragmentation. This is a great example. Habitat connectivity influences fish health, survival, and abundance. So in the upper left, you see that aerial photograph of what you consider a natural and healthy uh, mangrove, tidal mangrove creek. In the lower right, is a water control structure in Florida that basically acts as a dam on those types of, of creeks and rivers that used to flow uh, freely. And that prevents juvenile tarpon from going upstream. If juvenile tarpon somehow do get upstream, it prevents them as they grow and want to move out to the estuary, it prevents them from coming out. And it does the same type of thing to all the things they want to eat as prey. In addition, it affects the salinity um, of both the upstream and downstream areas. And so it, it come, becomes almost like what we call a faucet effect. When the structure is closed, it's high salinity, like the faucet's off. When the structure is opened, it immediately becomes low salinity, so the faucet's on. And again, those vast changes in the salinity of the waters in those creeks uh, causes a pretty dramatic uh, ecological damage. So these are a lot of the, the challenges that, that, that tarp and other fish are, are, um, are suffering from. So getting more specific, we'll talk about some of the habitat loss in Florida. And as I like to, to say that all the things that we're dealing with now, even the harmful algal blooms are within the context of a system that's already at a deficit. So Florida has already lost about 50% of its mangroves. So if you went back you know, 150 years ago, we're about 50% down on that. I think about it this way. The city of Miami 100 years ago, 120 years ago, was nothing more than a small fishing camp. It didn't exist. So if you look at Tampa, that's lost about 50% of its mangrove. Charlotte Harbor, about 60%. Indian River Lagoon's lost a lot. But interestingly, the mangroves that are still here, the majority of them are not usable as fish nursery habitat by the juvenile tarpon and even snook. And I'm going to circle back to this in a little bit when I describe some of our research. Um, we've also lost overall about nine million, more than 9 million acres of wetlands, which is close to 50% of Florida's wetlands. So from a, a fish, fishing, fisheries perspective, why is this important? Because these wetlands, these mangroves are fish factories. They're important juvenile habitat for a lot of species and a lot of prey. Say if you'd like to eat shrimp, uh, shrimp start their lives in the estuaries and don't move offshore to the shrimping grounds until they're adults. Um, for those reasons, they support the estuary and food web. So if we don't have wetlands, the estuary is not doing well. They provide shelter for juvenile game fish, um, as I've already talked about, and also the things that they eat. Um, and they also act as filters. So even if there's polluted water coming into the estuary, if it goes through a healthy wetland, at least some of those 
pollutants are removed. Moving on to seagrass, uh, Florida has already lost over 2 million acres. Uh, the Indian River Lagoons lost a lot, as has Florida Bay. Over 33% has been lost in Florida Bay. The Florida Keys is losing some grass, but it's also getting a lot of damage from uh, boat groundings and propeller scars. So at this point, 90% increase in the number of degraded flats, which is pretty horrific. And I said, I said the Indian River Lagoon, at least a 70% decline in seagrass um, throughout the lagoon. So again, why is this important? A seagrass provides habitat for more than 70% of fish species that occur in Florida at some point in their life stage. Um, it stabilizes bottom sediments. Um, if you have a storm event with waves, if you have a uh, turtle grass, um, you'll get some suspend, sus sediment suspended up into the water column, but not much. If you don't have that grass for a bottom, it just turns into a milky, milky uh, situation when you get uh, waves from storms. Um, they help to maintain good water quality as well, um, just like uh, of wetlands. And again, game fish prey. Um, if you like to fish, um, again, eat shrimp. Um, seagrass is super important. Moving on to oysters. Um, in some areas, uh, such as Indian River Lagoon, Charlotte Harbor and others, there's been an 80% decline of uh, oyster bar coverage, which is pretty tremendous. Um, and it's not only about their filter feeding capacity, which everyone's heard about, but live oysters provide better habitat than dead oyster shells. And there's been a lot of research that shows just because you have a bunch of oysters in the water doesn't mean that they're as good a habitat as if it's an actual live oyster bar. Um, and they also, as the other habitats I talked about, provide important habitat for game fish and their prey. And they help maintain good water quality. An oyster can filter uh, 50 gallons or more of water per day. Um, and so if the, if the water is not too polluted, because that will kill the oyster as well, uh, oysters, just like the clams, um, help to filter out a lot of, um, of, of the nasties and, and the harmful algal blooms from the water, which is good for the rest of the estuary. estuary. Um, and they help stabilize the bottom, um, for sure, um, they, which is one reason why uh, oyster bags are being used for shoreline stabilization, and hopefully that's a successful effort. And then moving on to water quality. So I already talked about alteration of fresh water flow, the timing, the amount, and the quantity. If you change that, you change the ecology's estuary. So this uh, figure um, from um, Everglades Foundation shows on the left the pre-drainage water flow in the Everglades before we uh, messed all the flow up, um, where the water came from and, and where it went out into Florida Bay, um, and lesser extent the Florida Keys. And then on the right is what the current water flow is because of the um, extensive um, poor management of the entire system. So Florida Bay is not getting enough uh, fresh water, which causes what we call hyper salinity conditions or too salty of a water. That causes a different type of algae bloom, which then kills the seagrass. The Clusahatchee and the St. Lucie get too much fresh water, much of it polluted with too many nutrients. And we all know the results of that from the different algae blooms. But what people don't realize is that although the Everglades is kind of the poster child for alteration of freshwater flow, it's not the only one in Florida. So in the upper left figure there, you'll see uh, my depiction, a lot of different, a lot of little arrows going from the land into the Indian River Lagoon. And that's how freshwater used to flow into the lagoon, through smaller creeks and wetlands. But because of all the modifications that we did through water control structures, we now have just a few areas where a lot of fresh water goes into. So, right, so we've altered where the water goes into the estuary from how it used to go in, how often it goes in, and how much comes in. And that, in many ways, contributes to the poor health of the Indian River Lagoon. Even before we had all these algae blooms, we had a sick system. And so it wasn't able to respond well to other pressures we put on it. Uh, we also have a lot of broken wastewater infrastructure, which affects uh, water quality, um, sewage treatment, and septic systems. So our sewage treatment infrastructure in Florida is um, largely outdated, uh, much of it many, many decades old. And if you read um, the newspapers, especially when we get a heavy rain, a lot of overflows of untreated sewage. But we also have uh, more septic tanks in Florida um, per capita than anywhere else in the United States. And we're basically on large limestone sandbar. And so septic tanks, especially near estuaries, don't work so well. And that figure on the right side depicts that. 
Um, when the water goes into the septic tank and then into the drain field, um, it's supposed to you know, go through the soil. And as it goes through that, all that process, a lot of the nutrients are removed. But because we have limestone, and which is very porous, and sand, a lot of those nutrients are not removed. So a large portion of the nutrients that are getting into our estuaries are doing so from septic systems that leach nutrients into the groundwater, which then is discharged into the estuary, or if the house is close enough to the estuary, um, directly through the soil into the estuary. Um, Indian River Lagoon, for example, uh, uh, the Northern Indian River Lagoon, I should say, a large portion of the nutrients getting into the lagoon or getting into the lagoon in this fashion. Stormwater runoff is also a big issue, whether it's residential or agriculture. Um, this is a picture of a stormwater pipe coming in off of Route 1 in the Indian River Lagoon. Um, and there's no filter, there's no wetland whatsoever. So every time it rains, all those contaminants that are on uh, Route 1 uh, flow directly into the Indian River Lagoon. Um, and working towards the end of this section, um, the increase in, nu in uh, nutrients from all these different sources uh, causes or enhances harmful algal blooms. We all know about red tides, which mostly occur on the West Coast, but if you remember, I think it was 2018, it was so intense that it actually wrapped around to the East Coast for, uh, I think it was about a week. Um, it was pretty bad in some spots. The brown tide, which mostly occurs in Indian River Lagoon. Uh, Blue-green algae blooms, which everyone's familiar with from the St. Lucie River, Caloosahatchee River, um, which are fresh water, but then flow downstream into the estuaries. And what doesn't get a lot of press coverage because it's not as obvious is benthic algae. And benthic is just another word for on the bottom. Um, and that lower right picture um, shows a clump of that benthic algae um, in someone's hand for scale. And there's some places where this benthic algae can completely coat the bottom for acres and acres and acres. And when it does so, it, uh, it shades out, smothers the seagrass. And when that algae dies off, again, it rots, takes away the oxygen. And so the seagrass is gone. A lot of the things that live in the seagrass are gone and you have a bare sand bottom. Um, and finally, uh, all the contaminants that I've been talking about, uh, they'll remain in the system for quite some time, even when we're able to get um, the source of those fixed. And this situation um, will continue. Unfortunately, this is a map of uh, the 20, on the left is the 2010 baseline of population density or uh, developed areas. And on the right is the projections for 2070 if current trends continue. And so all these pressures uh, mounting on our estuaries only continue um, to increase. Um, and in large part, the areas that are not developed are um, protected, somehow conservation lands. Uh, so the more conservation lands we can get under our belt um, moving forward, the better it is for our estuaries and our fish. Um, and finally, as far as a, a challenge for tarpon, are forage fish declines. This is a picture of a large school of menhaden, um, and tarpon depend on a lot of other type of forage fish or, or bait fish, we might call them, but menhaden is a big one. Um, and as I'll show you in the next few slides, um, tarpon undergo some pretty long migrations, and we think a lot of that's to feed. Um, in the mid-Atlantic, for example, I'm sure a lot of you have heard about the large menhaden fishery, which goes for things like fish oil, um, goes into makeup products, um, um, livestock feed, those types of things. Um, but unfortunately, the menhaden fishery, as you can see from this graph, which is a number of hundreds of metric tons harvested per year, um, there's been a long-term ongoing decline uh, from the time we have data until present. So an 86% decline. And the fishery or the fish population of menhaden was already depressed uh, before we started um, getting these types of data. So if tarpon and a lot of other fish, whales, dolphins, um, along the Atlantic seaboard and in the northern Gulf, Gulf of Mexico depend on these large schools of menhaden and they're being decimated by overfishing, that's having broad ecological effects as well. And so that's something that we're working on um, as far as getting that in included into management. Um, and wrapping this up, climate change um, has a lot of potential uh, to affect tarpon. We're not sure how it will. If they, when they do uh, migrate seasonally to spawn, will they migrate sooner if it's warmer is a big question. Um, does the seasonality of their prey um, change when it occurs and where it occurs? Um, will they, instead of going up as far as Virginia, which I'll show you some pictures here in a minute, maybe they go up as far as New Jersey. Um, and these areas don't have any regulations for tarpon. Uh, the benefit might be uh, being able to use wetlands and in places like South Carolina, North Carolina, if the winters stay warm enough, which would be a big advantage. 
Um, but in Florida, a big threat is sea level rise. A lot of the wetlands that remain um, don't have anywhere to migrate inland if sea level rises. Um, and so we might lose those habitats for tarpon. Okay, so I've been talking a lot about habitat, water quality, prey, all those types of things. But when we manage fisheries, um, this is a list of how we do fisheries management now. We worry about jurisdictional boundaries. So fish are managed differently in Florida than they are in Georgia, even though they're adjacent states. Or in the United States versus Cuba, even though only 90 miles, um, there's only a 90 mile difference between those two countries. Uh, they also are, all, are worried about how many fish are harvested or what they call discard mortality, which is how many fish are um, lost or die after being released, um, how much fishing effort occurs, and then of course, uh, stock assessment. What they don't talk about is all the stuff that I just spent the last 20 minutes or so um, talking about, all the habitat and ec ecological stuff. So part of our job at BTT is to do research to inform what has to happen in fisheries management, um, all those factors that the fisheries management agencies uh, generally don't incorporate in the stock assessments. And so I'm going to run you through a couple of those projects. Um, we've got a lot going on, but I'll stick to the, our, um, my two favorite. One is adult migrations. So we have used acoustic tracking tags, which is that in, uh, in the le left-hand uh, image. Um, the, this one lasts for five years. Um, they send out supersonic pings that have a, a coded identification um, for that fish. So each fish has a unique number. We surgically implant them in the fish. You can see the surgery going on there, both side. Uh, we bring them into a sling after we catch them, make an incision, put that tag into their abdominal cavity and send them on their way. And then those tags, uh, they ping in about every two minutes and they're picked up by what we call acoustic receivers or listening stations. And you can see a diver putting one in on the bottom. And so if a fish swims past one of those, they get picked up and we can track its movements. So the reason to track tarpon, and again, I'll circle back on a lot of these topics is uh, regional management. I talked about the jurisdictional problem and the impact, the impacts of things like fresh water flows, harmful algal blooms, climate change, those types of things. And also figure out the, ha the habitat hotspots so we can prioritize uh, where we think there should be protections or even restoration. This map um, depicts uh, all the little dots are different studies by ourselves and colleagues um, from Canada all the way around through the Gulf of Mexico of other studies that are using the same acoustic tracking technology. So they're putting tags in what they're studying. It could be groupers, it could be sharks and they're putting out the acoustic receivers or listening stations to track those. And so there's a number of different networks of all these scientists and we share data because we're picking up each other's fish. And so that allows us to have say 120 or so um, acoustic receivers in Florida. Um, and that obviously wouldn't tell us everything about tarpon but we can work with our colleagues uh, throughout the region to figure things out. And so this kind of gives you a broad overview of tarpon that were tagged in South Florida, the Florida Keys um, where they went. Um, you can see that these fish, and these are just straight line distances, so they obviously didn't uh, swim over land, but just to give you an idea of how far these fish went, um, and a lot of these fish do the same thing every year. What we're using now are five-year tags, so we can see if the same fish do the same behaviors, and a decent number of them do. So if a certain fish likes to go into a river in South Carolina, um, that we've tagged in the Florida Keys, it'll do that year after year, migrate up South Carolina, go into that river and come back to the Keys uh, when it starts to get colder. Uh, closer to home, um, for those of, of us on the East Coast, there's a fish that we tag um, up in, near uh, Cape Canaveral. You can see here with my cursor, um, the spot where we tagged it. Um, and then it moved uh, all around this area south and then came back the next year and started the same pattern. Um, a different way to look at this um, with this graphic on uh, the vertical axis is latitude and I've put some place the some locations there to give you an idea Daytona Beach, Stewart, Fort Lauderdale and each one of these dots is a detection on one of those acoustic receivers and you can see during uh, this axis is month you can see during summer July it's mostly staying uh, in the northern IRL and Cape Canaveral area up to Daytona Beach. And then once we get into the winter, we get some cold. It shoots down towards Fort Lauderdale where it hangs out to the next spring and then comes back up and starts that same pattern again. So as we see these types of patterns and we see changes like changes in water flow or algae blooms, 
Well, then we can estimate how those things are affecting the tarpon. And importantly, um, with the evidence now of these migrations, repeated migrations, I talked about regional management. Okay, Florida manages one way, uh, Louisiana manages a different way. We also have different management in every single one of these countries up along the Atlantic seaboard. So one of our goals is to um, implement a regional management plan uh, so that we've got good conservation uh, and management measures throughout the region. Okay, I also wanted to circle back to juvenile habitat um, because I've talked about that a lot because of the um, habitat and water quality issues. And we have had ongoing for about five or six years now, uh, have juvenile ha do, excuse me, juvenile tarpon habitat um, identification, protection and restoration program. And the way we identify these habitats is by reaching out to anglers and, and guides uh, through social media and other ways and ask them to tell us about where they see tarpon that are 12 inches or less. We ask them to give us specifics on exactly where, the size of the fish, the months of the year, and for them to classify the habitats as what they think of as altered or natural. Um, this gives you an idea of the locations, some of the locations we've identified. We've got over 250 now um, throughout southern half of Florida, but also up into the Carolinas, uh, northern Gulf of Mexico, and even uh, some in, in Central America that we're building. And I'm showing you this in a very coarse way because our purpose isn't to show people where they can find places to go fishing for tarpon, it's to inform management. So as we get this information, we share it with um, Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, Department of Environmental Protection and others, so we can get these places uh, protected or restored. So a quick graphic here on our process, uh, we collect locations, we um, ask the anglers and guides for their habitat characteristics, but being scientists, we don't just trust that. We send out uh, people to actually assess those locations with some pretty specific um, metrics on how to evaluate the habitats. If it's a natural habitat, we then propose to the various management agencies that these habitats are protected. And that feeds into the fisheries habitat management um, approach. If they are altered sites, then we prioritize them for uh, restoration. So for example, we are beginning now a project with Rookery Bay National Estuary Research Program to restore two locations in Southwest Florida that will restore around a thousand acres of uh, wet mangrove wetland habitat. We've got a number of those other programs ongoing as well, which I'll talk about one of them now. Uh, this is Charlotte Harbor on the west coast of Florida, just to give you a, a reference. And the green um, spots are natural habitats, the red ones are altered habitats. Bring you back to this map that I showed you already. On the right hand picture, uh, where I'm circling with my um, cursor, you can see those uh, remnant canals I mentioned before. And here's a bit more of a zoom in on it. You can see that naturally flowing creek, which is great. There is a creek here that still feeds these remnant canals, which is an abandoned development. <laughs> Um, and so what we've done is worked with colleagues with the Southwest Florida Water Management District and Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission and the Charlotte Harbor National Estuary Program um, to come up with a design um, on how we're gonna restore these places so we can see which one works better for tarpon. So on the top one, you see the marsh at the top, um, shallow water with a deep hole, um, and then what we call a sill, um, which is above the typical tide line, so that only at high tides or during storm events would water go over here. And that would allow the larvae to go in and to survive here and grow up as juveniles, but large predators couldn't get over. Um, another one with the same type of setup, but it's, it's tidal, so predators can get in. And then the third one has that sill, but no deep water. Now deep water is nice for times like now when it's cold, the tarpon can go down to the bottom, well, the water's not gonna be as cold um, and it increases their chances of survival. If the water temps get below about 50, uh, tarpon and snook as well, um, they, that's when they start to die. And if it gets into the 40s, they're pretty much done. So to give you an idea, everybody thinks of tarpon and snook as these big things. Um, um, you can he see here, this is centimeters. So this is about a two inch long, or two to three inch long fish. Uh, this is what we're talking about. These guys are the are what the factory's putting out um, to, to help um, to help the fishery and the populations. To give you a different outlook on what those canals look like now, this is during the restoration process. You can see that a bit of a creek channel. Here's your deep hole. There's the sill, and this leads to the 
the, the Ken Allen Creek that goes out um, into the estuary. And then this is a picture after the restoration, you can see the salt marsh um, and all the other um, natural looking habitat, um, which has worked really well. Moving over to the East Coast, uh, as I said, 85% or so of the mangroves in the Indian River Lagoon are not accessible to fish. And that's because uh, mosquitoes are managed by impoundment. And on the West Coast of Florida, they'll spray for mosquitoes, spray a larvicide uh, to kill the larvae. In uh, East Coast of Florida, Indian River Lagoon, they build berms. You can see my cursor here around the, uh, these mosquito wetlands. They'll have a few places, one here, one here, one here, where they have culverts that allow exchange of the water. So how they manage these places is uh, during the mosquito breeding season, which is typically May, mid-May through mid-October, they will close off the culverts. Here's some culverts right here using my cursor. Use pumps to fill up these impoundments so the water's too deep for the mosquito larvae to survive. They, they need that um, wet, muddy um, ground. Um, so if the water is too deep, mosquito don't survive, larvae don't survive as well. And then they'll keep that closed off from the estuary um, until October and then open it up again after mosquito season um, and allow some exchange of water. The problem is that in natural systems, the lower left picture shows you what a natural creek looks like. Remember I talked about in our restoration spot, having a shallow sill followed by deep water going back into a wetland. In contrast, the uh, mosquito impoundments in the Indian River Lagoon, uh, this is what that connection looks like. You can see in the lower right picture, the, um, the culvert on the inside, and then there's a culvert on the outside, and it's closed off because it's summer, um, and so the fish can't go in and out. So what happens in a natural system, like this one in the lower left, is that those juvenile tarpon and snook, um, they come in there as larvae in the summer, they stay back there all winter, and the next summer, when they're um, larger, maybe say 10 inches long or so, that's when they migrate out of those creeks. They emigrate back into, out into the open estuary. That's part of the natural process. When you put these uh, culverts up during that summer when they're supposed to migrate out, they can't get out. And so these are not acting, uh, the impoundments are not acting as good nursery habitats. So the way we measure this, um, uh, we, we basically construct an automatic toll booth system. Um, so if you have one of the automatic uh, toll booth things on your car, you have what's essentially what we call a pit tag. And we surgically implant those in the fish. You can see depictions here, just like we do for those larger tags for the adult tarpon. We, we uh, put antenna or uh, copper wire around the culvert opening. And if the fish swim through this culvert, they get detected. We have computers on land uh, powered by solar panels. So it's just like an automatic toll booth system. And you drive that through that toll booth, you're telling you have an ID code that comes off of your transponder, and that's how you get billed. Uh, we can't bill the fish, unfortunately, but we can tell when they go through. And so what we found is that the emigration rates, the number of fish that left during the, uh, the way the impoundments are managed now, even in winter, when the culverts were opened, no fish left. Because winter is not the time when their natural um, biology tells them that they have to leave. So what we did is we took a week or two during the summer where we would open those culverts to allow water exchange. And after a week, we closed the culverts again so the mosquito control district could refill the uh, impoundments to prevent mosquito breeding. And for juvenile snook, we, sat, we found that um, it was much higher, almost three times higher with that revised management. So more than um, say one or two fish going out, it was much, much higher. And with juvenile tarpon, it was even greater than that. So in other words, if we're able to change how we manage these mosquito impoundments so that during those summer times when we don't want mosquitoes to breed, we open those culverts up for say a week at a time every six weeks and then fill them back up, that actually allows a juvenile tarpon and snook to survive, which will help our fisheries and actually get those habitats back into a functioning ecology. So if you think about the big picture, all that I've talked about, um, if we restore proper freshwater flows, we reduce the chemical pollution that I talked about, and the nutrient pollution, as well as fix our habitats, that's how we can achieve healthy fisheries. And the thing is, even if you don't fish, this should all be important to you because those fish depend on the same things that we do for healthy living. They depend on clean water and healthy habitats. If we don't have clean water and healthy habitats, then everything around us um, doesn't work as well either. And that translate to, to, translates to human health as well. 
And so I never like to uh, give these types of talks uh, without also giving uh, people something to do. Um, one is to educate others, uh, not just with what you've seen here, but what you've learned in a lot of these uh, lectures that you see at the Florida Oceanographic Society or Harbor Branch. Another is uh, be the, grease, the, the squeaky wheel, contact your politicians, the local, state, and federal level, because uh, I guarantee you very few of them have heard from very many people about these issues. And if we continue to lose these habitats and get bad water quality, we're going to get to a point where we can't really recover. And we're doing as much research as we can to address these issues, um, but it's becoming more and more of a challenge. Uh, some people like to write letters or send emails. Um, uh, you can tag your politicians on social media, um, contact your local uh, um, print media folks as well, um, and tell them that you're concerned. And then help conservation groups, whether it's BTT, uh, Florida Oceanographic Society does a lot of good work or other, or other groups, um, get involved. Uh, no one's going to uh, work on these issues unless we really force them to do so. And with that, I think I'm right on time, so I'll wrap it up. Thank you. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Thank you so much, Aaron. Uh, as always, phenomenal presentation. Uh, we're starting to get some fantastic questions rolling in. If you have any questions for Dr. Adams, go ahead and fire them away, and uh, we'll start we'll start working through these. Uh, first question we have. How long does it take a tarpon to reach adulthood? Um, typically, a tarpon will become sexually mature between eight and 12 years old is the best estimates that we have. So 10 is a pretty good time frame to consider. All right. You talked a little bit about uh, tarpon spending their juvenile period in uh, mangrove impoundments or, or mangrove estuaries. What do they eat when they're little? And did the impounding of those wetlands impact their nutritional ecology? Oh, great question. Um, they eat, to some extent, what's available. Um, Zach, you know this, you did some research on tarpon, juvenile tarpon diet, and their diets are pretty variable. Um, uh, like in your study, Zach, I think they eat a lot of uh, bottom organisms. Um, in other places, they eat a lot of mosquito fish. Um, as they get larger, I think they eat more things like mosquito fish and killifish or mud minnows. Uh, when they're small, um, a lot of times they'll stay on the bottom because that's as far as they can get from uh, wading birds like herons and egrets. Um, uh, and as they grow larger, their, their diet expands. Um, so to the extent that they eat what's available, the more different types of prey that are available, the better it is, it is for juvenile tarpon. A project that we did on juvenile snook, which use these same habitats, a lot of overlap with juvenile tarpon. We did a project in, in Charlotte Harbor and we found that in um, mangrove wetlands that had altered freshwater flows, that the juvenile snook, their diet diversity or the number of different prey species we found in their stomachs was 50% less than juvenile snook in healthy habitats, right? And they also, I think it was, if I remember correctly, about twice as many juvenile snook in the altered or altered habitats had empty stomachs. Right, so those juveniles had a, a lower diversity diet and they were working harder to eat, eat that prey that was available. So mangrove impoundments, a similar type of situation. There's less prey, less, less diversity of prey, less prey. Um, and so uh, our, our data from a growth study on tarpon in one of these types of altered habitats on the West Coast uh, showed that the growth rates um, in some instances were almost zero over the course of a year. You know, you know, Aaron, one of the most interesting things I found looking at the diet of, you know, four, five, six inch long tarpon, there were lots of the usual suspects in their, in their bellies, little shrimp, little fish, but there were some little tarpon that were eating food items that were as small as grains of sand, little tiny copepods, tiny planktonic organisms, and they were eating thousands of them. And it, it almost, it almost shed some light on why these enormous tarpon, fish that are over a hundred pounds will still eat a two or three inch long fly. As juveniles, they're eating microscopic food and their feeding apparatus and their gills helps them eat things that are really small. And that may be part of the reason why a hundred pound tarpon would be just as happy to eat a giant mullet or a little tiny shrimp. Oh, for sure. And being, being diverse in diet like that, I think has helped them over the past hundred million years. Um, and the reason that scientists call this period now the Anthropocene is we're we're doing a similar thing that other extinction events have, have done is change the 
change the rules of the game so drastically, um, you know, that we're going to be losing some species and hopefully tarpon's not one of them. So we have a shark lecture coming up in March at the end of our lecture series. And on the East coast of Florida, there's, there's been kind of a, a controversial discussion about shark population numbers changing over time. Uh, certain members of our community are pushing for stronger protection of sharks and a certain segment of the angling community is concerned that there are too many sharks and those sharks are becoming predators of game fish that we value. So one of our viewers tonight is wondering that, you know, with increased protection of certain shark species and this perception that shark numbers are going up, has there been any impact specifically on tarpon that you've observed? Um, it's, it's a good question um, because uh, part of the issue is uh, there, are, there have been uh, more protections for sharks um, in Florida, um, not in a lot of other places. Uh, so depending on where you go, um, uh, sharks and tarpon interactions uh, can, can be a, a major issue. For example, if you fish for tarpon in Cuba or Belize or even Mexico, um, you, there are no sharks. Um, so it's not an issue at all. In Florida, um, yeah, we're getting increased reports of uh, tarpon um, eating sharks that are being fought by anglers. Um, the research so far doesn't suggest that that's, at least in the keys, so much of a learned behavior. It's just part of that overlap of interaction. Um, some colleagues tracked tarpon as well as sharks at the same time, and there's a lot of overlap, even when anglers are not involved. Um, I think a lot of it is a combination of shark protection, but also an increase in the number of anglers, right? The, I'll give you an example. If I remember the numbers correctly, the amount of boat traffic in the Florida Keys, and much of that is for fishing, has increased 70% you know, over the past five plus years. Um, so I think there's a lot more people fishing, um, which means that the, the sharks are getting exposed to a lot more tarpon or other fish. Um, that are in distress. Um, and so the natural reaction, of course, is to try and eat it. We're seeing the same thing with uh, permit in the Florida Keys, which is one reason Western Dry Rocks has now a, has a spawning season closure because something like 30 to 40% of permit that were hooked were getting eaten by sharks. Um, so yeah, it's an interesting interaction for which we don't have a ton of answers. Um, I think some of it may be uh, some revisions in management. I think a lot of it is anglers learning um, how to fish in the, um, in the context of sharks. And I can tell you that I've been fishing for tarpon for decades and I've only had one instance in which a shark tried to eat my fish. And that's in part understanding when and where to fish in relation to shark tarpon interactions. Um, I've made the tough decision of if I'm fishing for tarpon and sharks show up, I go somewhere else. Um, so there's a lot of different things going on there, I think. Um, you hear people talk about um, calling sharks, you know, harvesting sharks to, especially in hot spots like that. And there's been a lot of research done on that and it, it wouldn't be effective. We'd have to basically harvest so many sharks um, that they'd be, you know, on the brink of extinction as many of them were not that long ago. So it's a, it's a tough issue that we're going to be hearing a lot more about in the next five years for sure. So that's a good lead into our next question. I, I think there's a general perception in the angling community that tarpon are tough, they're robust fish. You know, I hear people say all the time, it swam away, so it must be fine. So one of our guests and I asked, what can anglers do to ensure the survival of tarpon after they release them? So kind of a catch and release handling type of question. Okay, that's a great question. So I'll give you some answers, but also send you, if you go to our website, btt.org, and um, click on education, uh, we've got catch and release handling practices for both uh, tarpon and bonefish. And Aaron, I'll, I'll share that link. We, we sent out an automated follow-up email so I can share that link. And uh, also for any of you who are interested, recordings of these lectures are all posted on our website. So if you have anybody who might want to watch this lecture at a later date, we'll, uh, we'll send you a link to that as well in our, our follow-up email. So a number of things to do is um, when you're fishing, um, number one, you land the fish quickly. Uh, so I'll you know, speak from a perspective of a, a fly angler. Um, if I don't have the fish uh, either boated or ex I'm sure the fish is you know, within a minute of boating, if it, I said a time limit of 20 minutes. 
if, if I want to land the fish, if I don't have that, that fish landed in 20 minutes, I break it off. Um, so keep the fights short if you can. Um, if you're using uh, conventional gear, um, again, you know, crank down the drag and, and, and land them quickly is a big one. Um, for fly fishing, we have the advantage of using what we call a shock tippet, right? So um, our leaders, you know, maybe let's say nine, 10 feet long, made of monofilament. And we have the end where the tarpon bites is probably 60 pound, 70 pound test. But we have a section in the middle that's only maybe 15 or 20 pound test. And so if a shark, if a shark comes along, I can actually grab the reel to straighten the line and pop that fish off by breaking that 15 pound test. If you're fishing conventional heavy gear, you really can't do that, right? Because you, ha you have say 50, 60 pound tests throughout. Um, and so that's something that we've got to figure out is how conventional anglers can um, be inventive in the gear situations that they do to allow themselves that ability to break off a fish if a shark shows up. When you do um, bring a tarp into the boat, as I said during the presentation, do not take it out of the water. Um, if you, matter of fact, if you've caught tarpon before, um, you don't have to land the fish. Um, research on, on a lot of different fish species shows that if they do, if we do leave the hook in the fish, um, they do a pretty good job of evicting that hook, uh, sometimes in hours or days. As an example, we've had uh, bonefish <clears throat> that we've hooked as part of research, we put them into the, we just cut the line, put them into the live well, let them um, recover before we do all our measurements and stuff. Uh, and sometimes they'll swallow the hook. Uh, I think almost pretty much every time we pull them out of the live well and the flies on the bottom of the live well. So these fish can get rid of those, those hooks pretty well. Um, if you want a picture, uh, keep the fish in the water, um, get your camera gear set up before you ever have the fish boat side. Um, things like GoPros are fantastic, but if you don't have that, you can still get great pictures with, uh, with cameras. Um, you shouldn't have to do much to revive the fish, but if you do, um, you don't want to move the fish back and forth. You need the water to go in the in mouth and out the gills. Um, at times, uh, people will um, kind of bump their boat on and off into a very slow forward idle to kind of help that water movement. Um, and yeah, but just because they swim off doesn't mean they make it. It's that that first few hours, uh, 90 minutes or more um, that they need to kind of get through to get themselves back in shape before they can avoid those sharks. Great, all right, so going back to algae blooms, um, one of our viewers tonight was wondering, you know, if Florida's current algae crisis continues on the trajectory that we're seeing right now, what will that mean for tarpon? Are they a species that'll be particularly sensitive to algae and algae blooms? Are they maybe not as sensitive as other species? What what you know, what does the future look like for tarpon with specific respect to algae and algae bloom? That's a great question. Um, and we have some research on red tide that we're working on now that kind of gives us um, some indication. So if you talk to, and um, for the moment, I'll talk about Southwest Florida, but it should apply to Southeast Florida and the Keys as well. <clears throat> if, if you talk to anglers and guides who are fishing for tarpon, you know, 15, 20, 25, 30 years ago, they didn't used to see red tides during tarpon season. If they saw red tides during the end of tarpon season, it would be like October, right? Which way back when we had normal weather, that's when you get your first cold front. So historically, there wasn't a whole lot of overlap of tarpon and red tide. More recently, there's been a lot of overlap. And what we're finding is that tarpon will not necessarily leave the area entirely, especially if it's during that spawning season. They move around and try and avoid the red tide. And most of the times they're able to um, avoid red tide because it's patchy. But in more recent years, as red tide and other algae blooms have become more widespread when they occur, um, we're seeing more tarpon mortalities. So that recent red tide that happened in um, Tampa Bay last summer happened so far up the bay and so quickly that it trapped a lot of tarpon and there were a lot of dead tarpon. So as these get these, these um, algae blooms get more expansive uh, and sudden. Um, my prediction is that we'll, we will start to see tarpon mortalities of the adults, which we didn't used to see, um, which is especially bad because in those early summer time periods, they're here to spawn. And so if we're hitting their, their spawning portion of the population, that's kind of a double whammy. Um, another problem, which is a potentially even longer term, which I mentioned during the presentation is, 
those red tides, even if they don't kill tarpon, they're killing a lot of what the tarpon eat. And so if we get periods where we have intense red tides over a large area that kills a lot of bait fish and crabs and shrimp, if it takes a long time for those species to come back, that means the tarpon have less to eat. And if a fish eats less, um, not only does it not grow, but it has a lower what we call condition factor, right? It's, it's like it's not eating enough to maintain its metabolism, doesn't have as many fat reserves, all those types of things. And spawning takes a lot of energy. Um, so if you fish for tarpon, you notice that before uh, spawning season, the tarpon are usually pretty chunky. Then they spawn, the females get rid of a lot of the eggs, which helps to reduce that chunkiness, but they also have expended a lot of energy. And so a reason we think they migrate northward to feed on the menhaden and other forage fish is they're basically putting on the feed bag to re-energize themselves for the next year. If as, as part of that whole process, when they're in Florida, the algae blooms are reducing the amount of prey they can eat, they're going to be less successful spawning, less successful avoiding predators and less successful in their migrations. <clears throat> so it's a lot of what ifs, but uh, it's a bit scary, yeah, long-term. So I'm, I'm scanning through these questions. We have some really, really great, great questions rolling in. I hope everybody will stick around for a couple more minutes as, uh, as Aaron goes through these. You talked a little bit about climate change and sea level rise. One of our attendees has a question about atmospheric CO2 levels. They're wondering whether there's any evidence to suggest that increasing CO2 levels might be affecting tarpon. They wonder whether any internal organs or behavioral characteristics can possibly be influenced by higher CO2 levels, higher levels of acidity in the ocean? Um, so there's been a decent amount of research on other fish species. Um, where to begin? Uh, it's been shown for some fish species like um, in the drum family that higher CO2, um, which causes uh, a more acidic ocean, um, affects the hearing of those species. Now for, for drums, lack, loss of hearing is huge because they communicate by drumming. That's why they're called, the, the drum, family is called drums. And a lot of that drumming is for reproductive purposes. Um, now we know tarpon can make noise, but we don't know what the communication purpose is. But hearing is also important to finding prey, avoiding predators, uh, navigating, et cetera. Um, there's some research that's just beginning um, now, so we don't have any results on other species, again, that colleagues are doing, um, that are looking into the extent that um, acidic ocean may be affecting uh, fish vision, which would also be pretty, pretty massive. There's been a lot of research on fish larvae, and I showed you the tarpon larvae a couple of times, and the acidic ocean, too much CO2, um, it tends to decrease growth rates, um, and so that affects survival. Um, so, you, so so the potential for those types of effects for tarpon, I think, is pretty significant. Um, but the research on that, given all the other stuff I just listed in the presentation, is pretty far down our priority list. Um, but I think we can use research from other species to estimate that it'll have negative effects. All right. Next question swings back to the, the fragmented nature of state-by-state -state fisheries management and regulations. Uh, the attendee was wondering if there are any states where tarpon are not catch and release only, and uh, whether the practice of killing tarpon in the United States for, for tournaments still exists anywhere. Uh, yes, uh, in Louisiana, has, uh, tarpon is not even listed in their fisheries documents at all. So there are uh, zero regulations whatsoever for tarpon in Louisiana. And they still do have uh, tarpon tournaments there um, that are um, essentially kill tournaments. Um, see, North Carolina uh, used some of the data that I presented uh, today that the, our colleagues at UMass did um, to make tarpon catch and release only in North Carolina, which is great. Um, South Carolina has increased the minimum size at which a tarpon can be kept um, to a pretty large size, which is great. It's a great step towards catch and release. Texas is the same way. The tarpon has to be at least 85 inches in Texas, I think it is, in order to be kept, which uh, precludes just about everything that's caught there from being harvested. And most of the guys who are catching the big ones in Texas aren't going to keep them anyway. Uh, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia have regulations, but they're not, um, not great. 
Um, they still allow harvest. There's a minimum size, but it would be great to see those made catch and release as well. If you get north of North Carolina, um, uh, the fish are completely unregulated. So as climate change likely influences farther north migrations, um, that's something we need to work on as expanding those. Is there any evidence that tarpon accumulate toxins in their bodies because they're so close to the top of the food web? Um, no evidence. We haven't done that research yet, but um, based on other species, I have no doubts that they've got a lot of contaminants in their tissues. And some of that will be you know, from being at the top of the food chain uh, in, in the coastal waters. So I would imagine if we tested them, they'd probably have pretty high mercury levels. Um, it's a good thing we don't eat them. Um, but uh, uh, an aspect people might not think about, and we're learning this with bonefish, is um, coastal species especially are exposed to a lot of pharmaceuticals. So our sewage treatment systems are not very good at, um, actually they're terrible uh, at filtering pharmaceuticals out of wastewater. And if we take medications, everything from opioids to um, blood pressure, whatever it may be, um, we only, our bodies only process some of that. And a lot of it gets flushed down the toilet. And so a lot of coastal species are being exposed to a lot of different pharmaceuticals. So I'm certain with the life history characteristics of tarpon, uh, they're being exposed to a lot of pharmaceuticals and research. And we're just getting into this aspect um, for the species that we focus on, but research of other fish in coastal waters shows that these pharmaceuticals can be can cause a permanent um, behavioral changes. It affects it essentially affects their brain chemistry, and so fish will be, uh, uh, for example, um, uh, less cautious. So they'll uh, migrate faster, move around faster. Basically, a lot of um, careless behaviors that result in them being eaten um, a lot faster, and so survival decreases. Um, it's been shown for salmon, a bunch of fish in Europe, some in the United States as well. Um, so those other chemicals like mercury, heavy metals, PFAs, et cetera, are definitely a concern, but um, the pharmaceuticals um, are here now and are a big problem. So one of, our, one of our guests spent years volunteering on research projects in some golf course ponds over in Charlotte County. And they mentioned that roughly 80% of the fish that they saw every time they sampled were juvenile tarpon. And they're wondering whether that's completely by chance that these, these larvae end up coming back to these same spots season after season, or whether there's maybe some imprinting or some genetic control over getting these little microscopic tarpon into specific places in order to increase their survival. So you'll remember one of the uh, images I showed was a 1950s aerial photograph in Southwest Florida. And all those different ponds and creeks and stuff way back then had juvenile tarpon in them. So the way that these, these larvae coming into the estuary get into these places is it's during the summer when water levels tend to be higher, higher high tides, it's also rainy season. So a lot of those areas, uh, coastal areas um, would get flooded. It doesn't have to be a ton of water, right? Just a couple inches. And those larvae would be able to get up little sloughs and creeks up into those types of ponds. Um, and so they're likely getting up into those golf course ponds the same way, riding the different currents. So it's not about a specific location or genetics. It's just that's their life history. That's what they've always done. And the golf course ponds, um, and you guys can do this if you want to try and do it on your own. The University of Florida has an aerial photograph database. And that's where I got that photograph from that goes back, I think, to the 1940s. Um, and you can actually look up in their database uh, specific locations and see what it used to look like. And then you can look at it what it is now. And that picture I showed you side by side um, with all the um, natural ponds and creeks and then what it is now, um, that was actually a golf course. <laughs> uh, and the golf course um, was uh, partially abandoned and that's the way a local conservation group was able to buy it. And then they've now restored it since then, right? And the tarpon were still there getting up in there. Another interesting thing about a lot of those upland ponds, golf course ponds for sure, is that a lot of times the tarpon can get in there as larvae, but they get stuck. So if we have like a dry summer or they change the way the water flows in those areas, those tarpon will get stuck and they can never get out. And because there's not as much food, their growth rate slows a lot. So rather than being say 12 inches after their first year or 16 inches, they might only be six or seven inches. And after two years, maybe seven or eight inches. 
And so some of those fish you're seeing as juveniles every year might actually be the same fish um, if they're not able to get out. Um, but when they grow that slowly, the other thing is if they do get out, because they're so small, they should be twice or three times the size, their chances of getting eaten is much, much higher than if they'd had a good place to be. So you touched on this next question a little bit during your presentation, but it's a fun one and I think it's worth digging into a little deeper. Uh, the guest says, I've seen large tarpon swimming in the St. Lucie River and surfacing ever so often, similar to a, a dolphin or a, a porpoise coming up. What are they doing when they do that? Are, are they breathing? If so, why would they be using that method of getting oxygen in the St. Lucie River? Well, it's interesting. Yes, tarpon can uh, gulp air and get it into their specialized um, air bladder, and which is kind of like a lung, and get that oxygen, right? Because there's a lot more oxygen than there is in, 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 um, in water, in seawater. Um, but they don't have to do that. Uh, tarpon, there have been experiments, uh, they can get 100% of the oxygen they need uh, just through their gills, um, like most fish. But they use that, I think, in many ways as kind of supplementary oxygen, when they're, especially when they're migrating, moving a lot. Uh, they'll also do that in situations uh, in estuaries where there's uh, lower oxygen, lower amount of oxygen. Um, so for example, um, if you have an algae bloom where it's a lot of the algae is sunk to the bottom and there's a lot of decay going on that sucks up the oxygen, the tarpon might um, roll more in those situations. So it can get enough oxygen from the, from the air, from gulping and still stay in those areas. Um, so that there's a couple possibilities, just normal behavior as it moves up the river, um, it gets supplementing itself um, and, or there might be lower oxygen in that particular area. And it's just um, uh, you know, taking advantage of that characteristic. I think the next question you probably wouldn't have been able to answer even just a couple of years ago, but we, we, might, have, we might have some insight now. Uh, the attendee is wondering whether tarpon populations in the Eastern Atlantic and the Western Atlantic are completely separate or do they ever mix? Oh, no, there's a decent amount of mixing. So if we, if we tag fish in the Florida Keys, for example, we find that probably the majority of fish go up and down the East Coast, up and down the Gulf of Mexico, but a decent number of fish go back and forth. Um, and one reason we use these multi-year, these five-year tags is so we could see those behaviors. Previously, we've been able to see them for just a few months at a time, the movements. But now that we see those, those behaviors in multiple years, we're seeing that some fish are just you know, creatures of habit and it's the same thing every year. Other fish, they might go up the East Coast one year, up the West Coast the other. Um, so I think there's a lot of mixing. Um, and then from a genetic perspective, because those larvae drift around for 30 days, um, fish that are spawned in the Gulf of Mexico could very easily end up coming in, um, you know, Jupiter and you know, the different inlets. Um, uh, we've even had some fish larvae that came into the Sebastian Inlet that when we looked at their age and backtracked the currents, um, um, a colleague of ours, John Schenker, figured they probably got spawned off uh, the coast of Charlotte Harbor, and then she got swept around Florida that way. So yeah, there's a lot of mixing back and forth. It's not like snook where they're so split. And Aaron, I think just in case I, I'm reading that wrong, I think they might've been asking about the East Coast of the US versus the West Coast of Africa. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, that's a completely population. different question. Yeah. Um, there's no evidence of migration across the Atlantic. Um, we've got no records of movement, no records of catches on long lines um, or anything like that coming across the Atlantic so far. So we, we have a, somebody that fishes for tarpon in the St. Lucie River, and they were wondering whether LACO discharges and specifically periods of time where there's cyanobacteria coming with those discharges affect the tarpon that are using the estuary. Um, we don't know, unfortunately. Um, we're help, hoping to learn that, and we're looking into that with uh, red tide. Um, but one advantage with red tide in Southwest Florida is that FWC has been sampling for red tide on a regular basis for years. And so we can look at the tarpon movements in relation for that sampling. In contrast with the algae blooms in the St. Lucie River, we really don't have very good sampling data to be able to, you know, spatially and to map that over space and time and then compare that to tarpon movements. So that's a really good question. But you know, given the, given the, um, the neurotoxin tendencies of the cyanobacteria, um, I can't imagine it wouldn't 
help but have a negative impact on tarpon and a lot of other species. One of our viewers is wondering whether there's any cooperation going on between BTT and, and the government of the Bahamas on, on research and fisheries management. Yeah, a lot. Um, uh, for example, we use similar techniques to what I discussed here with tagging and tracking, um, figuring out where they spawn, um, and have shared that information. And in 2015, 2016, um, five new national parks were implemented to protect uh, bonefish habitats, their home ranges, spawning migrations, and spawning areas. Um, there's another, I want to say 12, 16 locations that we proposed for um, habitat protections for the same purpose that are being considered now. Um, so yeah, we interact a lot with the governments uh, wherever we work, and that's the whole purpose of what we do. I love the research, it's a lot of fun, but the reason we do it is to make uh, conservation and management better. So unfortunately, I think we only have time for one last question. I apologize to everybody who, who uh, whose questions I didn't quite get to, but I'll I'll let Aaron make a little, a little plug with this question. Uh, <laughs> This person's a conservationist and looking to support BTT, and they're wondering how far off is the new Bonefish and Tarpon Trust license plate? Um, as soon as we get uh, 3,000 people pre-register, um, which if you go to our website, you can click on a thing and do it all online. Um, you basically pay, I want to say 30 bucks um, per tag, and you can get a tag for every vehicle you own. As soon as we get up to 3,000 of those pre-registrations, then the, then the tag gets printed. And we're a little bit over a thousand now. Um, so the more people that, that sign up for it, um, the better. Because uh, that's definitely the coolest looking tag out there. Well, for, for all of you who are still tuned in, and we've got over a hundred people still watching, uh, BTT is a phenomenal organization. Definitely check out BTT's website. And uh, if you're looking to support hands-on conservation, if you're an angler, if you care about Florida's waterways, they are a fantastic organization to support. So Aaron, thank you for your evening. I really appreciate you giving up your time to hang out with us and, and teach us a little bit more about tarpon conservation and research. For, for the rest of you, I really want to thank you again for hanging out with Aaron and I. Uh, I hope to see you next week for Dr. Todd Osborne's presentation about these super clams, you know, one possible tool in our tool chest for trying to fix the problems that are ailing the Indian River. Remember, all of our previous lectures, as well as tonight's lecture, will be posted on the FOS website, usually a couple of days after the, the lecture is wrapped up. And uh, if you haven't had a chance to look at our upcoming lectures, please swing by that website after you're done here tonight and see if any other lectures catch your eye. Thanks again, everybody. Thanks, Aaron. Have a great night. We'll see everyone in a week.